Oh. Okay. Um, tomorrow, uh, you're gonna read some scientific articles dealing with aquaporins, which are channels that we're gonna learn about towards the end of this section right here. The chapter five is about membranes, so chapter four is all about the organelles, kind of the inner parts. Now we're gonna take a look at the cell membrane and how cells can interact with one another, how they can signal, how they can latch on, um, how they can move things in and out efficiently. So the learning objectives for today is understand the biochemistry of phospholipids, how they're organized in the cell membrane, know the function of each of the four components of a cell membrane, describe the six classes of membrane proteins and how it interacts, and then understand the importance of selective permeability. Um, and so we will do a lab next week dealing with um, Osmosis and diffusion is probably going to take us a couple days because there will be an inquiry uh, component to that where you get to investigate um, your, own, your own question. The cells need to interact with their environments, uh, but they're enclosed in a lipid membrane that you know separates them from their environments and keeps things inside of them. Remember, cells are mostly made of water. Um, so with their phospholipid, you have the polar heads that are interacting with molecules inside on this side, and then the phospholipids on this side are interacting with other molecules as well. There are also protein passageways that can allow substances in and out. So if things are really, really small, they may be able to wiggle their way through the phospholipids to get in or out, um, like water can easily diffuse in and out. Um, if it's uncharged, in or out. If it's a huge macromolecule, it's too big. It'll just bounce right off the cell surface, needs to find a different way to get in, maybe through endocytosis or maybe a specific channel for that macromolecule. Um, charged ions, you know, they, they can't wiggle their way through because of these um, nonpolar tails. So some things can, you know, wiggle on through, some things cannot. So I think this diagram does a better job than this one. Hydrophobic molecules, oh yeah, they're going through. Small uncharged, well if they're small enough, they'll wiggle through. Large uncharged, no. So glucose and sucrose will have to find a new way to get inside the cell, especially ions. So let's take a look at the structure of the membrane. And the model that we use today is called the fluid mosaic model. Um, and so basically, I always like to think of these phospholipids as heads, like they're people. So you got heads and legs, and they're in a giant mosh pit. And they're just jumping and moving around and you know, working their way towards the front, maybe getting pushed back. That's how I envision phospholipids in a mosaic model. Uh, because they're moving, but not only that, they can switch sides. So they can go upside down on their head yeah, and uh, back. Okay. So phospholipids are the foundation. Remember, the head is polar. It's hydrophilic. It loves water. The tails are nonpolar. Hydrophobic hates water. So this is just, you know, a review for what is a phospholipid. You have a glycerol linked to two fatty acids. There's also a phosphate in there, fatty acid tails. Um, if you see a double bond, you get the kink. Okay. If it's no, if there's no kink, then it's saturated. Now the kinks play a, a role in the level of permeability. The more kinks you have, well now you can't pack them as much. So then things can slip through the cell membrane a lot easier. So the more kinks you have, all like things can push on through or get inside or leave, etc. So why is it that unsaturated are like better for you then if, if other things can get through and stuff like that? Well, because it allows like water in a lot easier, which is can be good. Um, but is that it, why it's water and you have like yeah. the different things? So early models though, it wasn't always this fluid mosaic. Um, before you know, they just thought it was lipids, but then they realized that there were protein components in it. So uh, they thought maybe proteins covered the inner and the outer kind of like a coat of paint. You know, like the phospholipids were sandwiched between the two layers of the proteins. Um, membrane proteins are not very soluble in water. So then we got to talk a little bit about what those proteins are made up of. A lot of times we call them globular proteins because they have a lot of nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids associated with it. However, if the phospholipid layer is sandwiched between these two globular proteins, um, how do you know polar regions kind of like interact and dissolve? So there are some questions, some holes to this theory, but this this is the sandwiched model what they thought it was. Um, other models came into play. Well, geez, maybe there are some pores and we have a protein coat, so there's just like holes drilled in. Uh, that's no longer the case anymore either. Um, 
so yeah, lots of ideas for how this came into play. So the model we use today is the new model, Singer and Nicholson back in 72 proposed the fluid mosaic model, that these globular proteins that they found when they analyzed it were inserted into the phospholipid bilayer. They have nonpolar segments that are in contact with the nonpolar regions of the tails. So this is the fluid mosaic model. It's a fluid. It's always, it's dynamic. It's changing. These proteins can move too. Um, so yeah, lots of things going on here. Notice we have some cholesterol that's embedded. <coughs> Cholesterol is a form of lipid. We have, we're going to talk about peripheral proteins, um, integral proteins. Integral proteins just mean that they're integrated. They go all the way through um, phospholipid bilayer. We've got some carbs. Remember, carbs are usually used as a form of identification. So we'll talk about that too. So the mosh pit model, is that, is that an incorrect model? No, well, it, no, it's still a mosh pit. And I'm going to show you, that's the Probably like that one. model, is that like a, an accepted one? Like yes. Okay, so cell membranes, there are four component groups. We've discussed the phospholipid bilayer. Very flexible, it's a barrier to permeability, it's selective. Certain things can pass on through, but not everything. Maybe in biology 10, you guys had to think of an analogy for a cell membrane. Maybe life science? Yeah, we're doing that life science. Okay. What was your life science teacher? Okay. All right. Yeah. Do you guys remember what she oh, said? Oh, yeah, because I still remember the pancakes with the gold leaf. Okay. Didn't we do like around the school? Like so like you would say that. like the walls or the doors. I remember the back walls. Because I vacuums. remember taking a picture of Mr. Lampert. I don't know what he was, but he's probably the new yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I always tell my kids that the cell membrane is kind of like a club bouncer. Some people can get in, some people can't. Okay. It's like it'd be like Rourke. Explain. <laughs> Oh, Rourke accepts some people and other people he's like, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Woo. Okay, another component of the cell membrane, transmembrane proteins. These are the ones that can float. They can provide passage into or out of the cell. We also call them the integral membrane proteins. So these are the proteins that are kind of like in, that, that go on through um, the phospholipid bilayer. We'll look at the interior protein network, which is an intracellular proteins and help they just reinforce membrane shape. It's the reason why red um, blood cells have a biconcave shape, the donut shape that you're so familiar with, and it's because of a protein called spectrin that links other proteins in the plasma membrane to help kind of scaffold and provide structure and support to it. Um, we'll also discuss the peripheral membrane proteins, how they're not a part of the structure, but they are linked to the plasma membrane. Okay, so some pictures of what I just discussed. Here's my peripheral membrane protein, and it's on the like the outermost, so it's like this is outside the cell, this is inside the cell. Okay, and then the integral is the one that's actually that goes through the phospholipid <coughs> layer. This is showing the red blood cell with the proteins that are involved with structure and form, and so we're gonna zoom in on spectrin right here. So spectrin is green. And they act like little cross bridges, but they anchor at certain parts um, on the inside of the plasma membrane to help form that biconcave shape, that donut shape. And so within, when you get the mutation, well, it has something to do with not making those proteins correctly, and then you get the sickle shell, sickle cell shape. Well, the spectrum is just in like blood cells and red blood cells. That, yeah, spectrum is just in red blood. It's just in a specific example. We also have cell surface markers, so I need you to think back to how proteins are made. You know, like uh, mRNA leaves the nucleus, uh, hooks up to a ribosome, maybe this ribosome's on the ER, gets packaged as a vesicle in the ER, transported to the Golgi apparatus for further modifications and final destination, in this case, maybe to, to the plasma membrane because it's going to be a cell surface marker. Well, as it's being modified, we're going to uh, modify by adding glycolipids and glycoproteins. And each cell type has its own little marker for glycoprotein with lipids. So it's, it's, it's just like its own little combination of, or uh, recipe, or like, you know, red blood cells have this and skin cells have that. Um, we used to think that the plasma, or sorry, yeah, the plasma mem membrane of, um, of cells was uniform, 
but that's not the case. Um, it's not homogenous. Instead, we kind of describe it as microdomains. There are distinct areas on the plasma membrane that have lipid and protein composition. So they call it a lipid raft. Maybe some parts of the cell are super heavy with lipids, like it's enriched with cholesterol, or um, even cholesterol is kind of a big one that's in there. But it helps um, make the phospholipids more tightly packed by shoving in cholesterol. So if I go back a couple slides and show you that cholesterol, let's move it back here. So sometimes you see cholesterol packed in there, and what they're trying to do is just make it the plasma membrane tighter, like pack the phospholipids closer together so things can't get in and out. So what happens when you push the cholesterol? Like you mean talking about the bloodstream? Yeah. yeah. Well, anywhere? Anywhere? Well, I guess the big question, well, cholesterol is bad for the bloodstream because it forms clots. So, so your cells can't take in the cholesterol and maybe pack it and keep it out of the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, it's just floating in the air. So they just can't take it. Yeah, they can't take it. So. Okay. Right. So this diagram is showing the um, cell ID marker. How every cell has, you know, um, little markers that say, "Hey, I'm part of you." And if it's a foreign ID, the, the, if your T cells don't recognize it, okay, now they're going to latch on and they're going to recruit more help and eventually phagocytize you or, or destroy that foreign cell. Um, so actually some diseases are the result of your cells not being able to recognize foreign, you know, foreign material or they misrecognize the cell that actually belongs to you. So then they actually, your own cells are killing you. That's sad. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I mean by a lipid raft. So here I have a phospholipid bilayer, okay? And a certain area is just jam-packed with proteins and lipids. And you can see that the cholesterol has been wedged in here. But it's only in this certain region. So this is a lipid raft, a.k.a. microdomain, um, because it's not uniform throughout. That's what they're talking about. They thought that, the plasma membrane was like this, all the way around. That's not the case. Some areas have lots of proteins or channels or maybe cholesterol jam-packed into it. Other areas, it's just this. So that's all I'm saying. Are they like lines? Like oh, they're, they're cute. Oh, yeah. So then they're, they're, just, they're just crossing over. Yeah. <laughs> like holding pearls. Looks like you're holding So some evidence to support everything I've just discussed, electron mic microscopy is a big one. Um, so what they do is to get these images, a lot of times they'll in take a, in this case, a microphage of the cell that they're looking at uh, and embed it in Ryzen, okay? And then they're going to take an ion beam and just like try to like cut just a sliver of it off. Um, a thin layer, I mean, super, super thin, and then you can get images like this and so all they did was just keep cutting it and look at each little cross section so we call this epoxy matrix embedded into a, you know, some type of epoxy block maybe ryzen um, shavings less than one micrometer thick so pretty small and then look at it underneath an electron microscope make a diet too so you can look at some shavings can they see down with like a nanometer Um, another way is freeze fracturing. So here is you somehow rapidly freeze the tissue. Um, maybe there's some like nitrogen of some sort. Um, and then you take a knife and you chip, like, chip away at it. And the lipids or like the cell membrane, if you get really lucky, it's like this outer region is stuck to this ice, or this frozen whatever. Uh, and then you just peel it away, and you can see the imprints or indents of the proteins that were embedded in there. And then on the other half, you get you still have the proteins there. So we call this freeze fracturing. So this would be um, inside and then outside. So this was on top of that, and they peeled it off. And so you can see some of the indents, and then you can see all the proteins still inside the phospholipid um, membrane. So they'll freeze it. They'll, t they'll tap it with a knife peel it away, you can see the proteins, the carbs, everything, 
sticking out on both halves. And then a lot of times they'll make a cast using platinum. So. Okay, moving on to phospholipids. Um, so structure again, I can't stress enough phospholipid structure here. So backbone is just three carbons, one, two, three, and it's attached to, this is your glycerol. Um, two of the carbons are attached to the fatty acids, and then the third carbon has that phosphate group that makes it hydrophilic, and the tails are hydrophobic. Okay, so these phospholipids, they'll spontaneously form bilayers because the phosphate heads will be attracted to each other and the tails will interact with each other. Um, and so because of their hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, bipolar regions or two different regions, that's how they cling together and that's how they form vesicles and these seals or however you want to describe it. So then when the two layers form, the tails face each other. They never come in contact with water because they're hydrophobic. Um, bilayers form spontaneously. A lot of times you have to look at the maximum number of hydrogen bonds. Is it saturated or insaturated? Um, but like I said, phospholipids are perfect for the cell membrane. So. Okay, so like I said, it's fluid. And I'm gonna, I do have a video on the next slide that shows you how fluid it is. Um, bilayers stable because hydrogen bonded never stops. It holds everything together because you got the, the hydrophilic heads that you know are interacting with water and with each other, and the tails interacting with each other. So it's a pretty stable structure. Interactions between phospholipids are weak, so that's why they can move around like people in a mosh pit. So here's a video. I'm gonna oh, okay. Hold on, I'll have, probably have to grant access to it. Grant access. Between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. <coughs> the survival of all life rests on this veil of material. A supple membrane, just two molecules thick. Okay, so the fluidity can change, uh, and you can alter it by changing the composition of fatty acids. So saturated fats make the membrane less fluid because you can pack them more together. Unsaturated fats, that's the kink. Uh, you can't pack them as closely, so then it's a little bit more fluid. You can add sterols to either increase or decrease fluidity depending on temperature. So temperature also plays a role with it. So this diagram is showing how phospholipids can move. They can swap places like this, or they can even flip flop from outside to inside and vice versa. Jocelyn's will be here to meet with Beth Mark about class rings on Monday, October 8th in the auditorium. Students interested in taking some oil safety class need to sign up for the community at us by October 17th. All students interested in yearbook, Please report to Mrs. Folsom room during snack break today. Also with Nathan Johnson and Emily Trish from City Office of the Bell Thank you. So unsaturated hydro hydrocarbon tails with kinks. Um, as you can see, it's not as packed, okay? While as this cell membrane, no kinks, you can pack them together. Okay, so here's an example as to how bacteria can fluctuate their cell membrane according to their environments. So if you have an increase in temperature, 
it means that the cell will be more fluid. If you have a decrease in temperature, you want to be less fluid. So they have actually involved the mechanism to maintain fluidity despite temperature changes. So they have an enzyme called a fatty acid desaturases. Um, and what they do is they introduce double bonds in fatty acid molecules. So at colder temps, double bonds are added to make more fluid. And then at warmer temps, they probably have another enzyme that goes in and gets rid of that double bond to maintain that fluidity. So it's kind of cool how they can maintain it themselves. Okay, I'm not exactly sure how far I'll get, so I'm going to go as far as I can here. I've got six slides, but... Okay, proteins, they're also embedded into the, the phospholipid bilayer, and they have many functions. They can be transporters, very selective. Maybe they only allow potassium or sodium in or out. Uh, so they can be very specific or kind of generic. Proteins can also be enzymes attached to the membrane, and they can help carry out reactions as soon as they get a signal. Cells, uh, they act as cell surface receptors. They can assist in chemical messaging when we talk about um, cell apoptosis or cell suicide. Um, we'll, we'll talk about chemical transduction pathways, how one protein gets turned on, sends the message to another protein, and it just keeps ca this cascading effect of sending a message, kind of like playing telephone with inside the cell. We have cell surface identity markers that can help identify other cells. Cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, which means that they will stick or glue themselves together. This can be for temporary or permanent. So when we talk about em embryo development, how cells migrate where they need to be, use cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. And they can also make attachments to the cytoskeleton. You saw that with spectrin in red blood cells. Um, so they can help anchor themselves to other proteins or to other structures. So this diagram just shows the functions of plasma membrane proteins, how it can be a selective transport channel, an enzyme, a cell surface receptor where something, you know, links onto it and then it's like, okay, you go do this now. Um, attachment to the cytoskeleton, spectrin, or maybe even with actin filaments, cell adhesion, they stick to other cells or other surfaces, and then that identity marker. So the enzyme, does that mean a multi-analogy? Um, an enzyme just means it carries out a chemical reaction. So maybe this is the reactant, it comes in, oh, and now it leaves as a new product. Okay, with structural features of the membrane protein, it's very diverse. Remember proteins, they can be anything. There's so many combinations of amino acids, and there's no set you know, number of sequences. So we have diverse function with diverse structures, but there are some common structural features. What did we call them in chapter, was it chapter one or oh, no, chapter two? Starts motifs, with the letter motifs. motifs, okay? So there are some motifs out there. So like one motif of membrane proteins is anchoring. Okay, many proteins are attached to the surface of a cell membrane, you can kind of think of it as a ship to a floating dock, and these proteins are anchored, um, but they're, they're kind of free to move on the surface, but they kind of just stay in the same region. So these anchoring proteins do have modified lipids to keep them anchored in an area. And so here is my phospholipid bilayer with some cholesterol and all that, and then this is my anchor. You can kind of see how it's like a screw, if you will. And it comes in, it loops, it screws again, it loops, it screws again, and so it's forming an anchor uh, within the phospholipid bilayer. So that's actually kind of cool. So here's another way that proteins can become anchored. It goes on through, but then they kind of, a, you know, I know this is a cartoon diagram, but they just anchor themselves. So they just kind of go with the phospholipids, but they're in a general area. We also have transmembrane domains. Um, so again, screwing on through here, and then maybe having a hydrophobic region uh, that can interact with the, the fatty acid tails. Um, you can have multi-pass. Okay, we'll just stop right here.